our group has finally settled and agreed that this is, in fact, our 40th year as a band. <laughs> it took us many years to come to that agreement. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of been a lot of very talented people coming through that band, and uh, you know, I mean, it's it's probably the longest lasting folk band around Boston. I I can't think of anybody else that's been at it longer. So. Well, and we have these uh, reunion concerts once a year. They've been going on for 30 years or more, where everybody Since who's 1975, I think, <laughs> who's everybody who's ever been in the band, and if they've only been in it for a month or two, is invited. A, comes back and if we can find them, <laughs> comes back and tries to you know perform. And what was it a year or two or three ago? We there was like 15 people on stage that 16. all came yeah. back for the reunion people. concert. It was amazing. And they come back from China, from, from Eng Taiwan, I mean. From England. From England. From Colorado. Colorado. New, New Jersey. Jersey. Yeah. Tell me about how this great band got started. When Owen Hartford and I uh, became roommates in Worcester in the teacher corps program in the late 1960s, early 1970s. And Owen had a friend who was a minister at a church in Gloucester called The Church. And, but they had church suppers and uh, they, the minister invited us, Owen and I and uh, our, a couple of friends who played with us, to come and play music for a church supper. And the minister um, turned to me and he said, you know, this is great. I'd like to introduce your band to the, to the assembled. What's the name of your band? <laughs> so we didn't have a name. And so I looked down on the music stand and on the left-hand side there was a hornpipe and on the right-hand side there was a clog. These are dances. And uh, so I said, we're the um, Hornpipe and Clog uh, Society. And he turned to the, uh, the dancers and he said, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce to you the Gloucester Hornpipe and Clog Society. And so that's who we were. And the name has stuck with us ever since. And it took a long time before it began to coalesce into something. And I think part of what made it, it come together as a real band was that we got together all these tunes that we knew or that we could know, that, that was interesting, and I Xeroxed them. And I thought Xeroxing was kind of a, a new process around then. And so I knew somebody at BU who had an office who had a Xeroxer, and so I put together like a half a dozen books. Book, yeah, them, yeah, 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 yeah. Some of, we still have that book. We do. And that was, was the kind of, once that happened, then we kind of thought of ourselves as, as a real band, because nobody knew all the tunes, and nobody knew exactly how they went, and what the chords were. Well, yeah. You had music and I guess you and Vinny had pieces that you were playing and then I would come over and maybe there would be a harmony or you'd say it would sound good if there was a little harmony here. And then he would, you would play harmonies uh -huh. as well. And so we kind of worked out of those tunes. I remember the three of us. I was going out with Jeremy at the time and going over to David and Rita's house um, and somebody handing me this book with the yellow cover. Oh yeah, uh, the book. The book. 
Right. So I had. I, knew See, I think had... making the book was a key moment. Yes, yeah. you but, asked what but, what made this what helped form it into the band that it became. I think the book is one one big factor. Yeah. We didn't we didn't think of ourselves as as an ethnic. No, band. we we wanted, and in fact, one of the best aspects of the band to me was that we played different music. Yeah, exactly. Different ethnicities. That's the whole point. We had point. someone composing music. And, it was traditional know, music, but not not traditional Irish or traditional right. We weren't American, locked into anything. in that in the beginning we didn't pay ourselves. We were kind of socialist band. And um, so we started out just playing for fun, playing for events, playing for uh, events that, for instance, there was a, a fundraiser for rent control in the city where I lived and worked. And somebody called me up at work the next day and said, I was at your concert last night. I think you're a great band. Do you have a manager? I said, uh, no, we don't have a manager, but he said, could I be your manager? I said, I'm not sure you understand. We're not really a real band. He said, that's okay, I'm not a real manager. So it was a marriage made in heaven. And whereas we had just done things for fun or word of mouth or significant events, like a marriage of one of the members, we then had this guy finding jobs for us and taking a small percentage. And he worked in the software industry. And so we started making money, but people thought, you know, it's not that much money. Everybody had a day job. And we thought, instead of paying ourselves, let's put the money in an account. That was kind of a socialist band. And once we had a certain amount of money, we'd decide to do something. Like we used to have an annual deep sea fishing trip, or we would take ourselves to a nice restaurant. And then when we had more money, we thought, let's make a recording because we had some people writing original music, and we liked our sound, and we thought it would be fun. The, the band always focused on, um, you know, food. I thought for like several years, the, the, the goal of the band was to save up whatever money we made and go to an Indian restaurant, restaurant in Hartford, and then spend all the money. So that... One of the things we did during that time period was uh, a big outdoor concert in Amherst or maybe Northampton. Um, there was another one fairly big um, that we did in front of the aquarium. Because that was Probably kind of like a big concert. It was, it was huge. And yeah. uh, it was, we had a big, huge audience there and people were dancing in the plaza and uh, it was a kind of a big deal. When one of the uh, formats that the early band uh, used to use was that we would play um, half of the evening would be a concert format and the other part of the evening would be uh, dance, country dancing uh, with dance instruction um, and so it was, it was kind of a, like an original uh, concept and it got it got people involved. And basically, the, the band was covering all the bases: traditional Irish music, um, international folk music, sea shanties, and uh, dance instruction to try to get the audience involved. And it was a quite a unique experience. I don't know how many other bands were doing that at the time. In '78, though, was a big event: <laughs> the blizzard of '78, and. Um, your friend arranged for the band to perform 
at Michael Dukakis's party in which he thanked all of the state workers who did such a fabulous job during the blizzard. And it was right in the state house. And it was in the state house. And, and we have pictures. Oh, we have pictures of Michael Dukakis and the band, you know. <laughs> <laughs> It's too bad he didn't get to be president. Then we could have, you know, played in the White House probably. What was it? Yeah, we, we recorded our first album early on. 79. Yeah, but... Right here. <laughs> but some So-called white album. <laughs> but the album came out, and uh, to our delight and uh, my astonishment, on April 10th, 1980, Frank Dudgeon, the uh, folk music critic of the Boston Globe, in the calendar reviewed the, our first album and so here's what he said certainly no one can fault this group of folk musicians for not trying to give people their their money's worth this album contains 17 tracks five with vocals and 12 instrumentals uh, that's not a ringing endorsement right now. wait 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 it gets better it gets better with most of the tunes based on Irish and English traditional music, sprinkled with everything from Greek love songs to It's a Sin to Tell a Lie. The album is uneven, but for the most part, the Gloucester Hornpipe and Clock Society has produced a real charmer. That's the part we picked up on in our publicity, a real charmer. <laughs> anyway, my favorite sin, he goes on, uh, he has a number of favorites. <clears throat> And then he says, the liner notes tell us that these musicians have been playing together in New England for nine years. Uh, he says, it shows. That we've not, been together. Right? Yes, not in a slick, polished style, no, no, no. but rather a feeling that these nine people have a grand time playing together. Occasionally, the recording mix sounds a bit strange or a note doesn't quite make it. But what these folks have succeeded in putting on vinyl are some fine melodies. Quite a few grins, mostly good performances, and a lot of feeling. Kept me listening and smiling. The LP's available and so forth. So it's, it's oh, basically a good, nice. for a first album, it's a pretty good yeah. review, don't you? I'm not sure it led to a lot of album sales, but it, <laughs> it was nice to have. One of our tunes on the album was uh, Pretty Little Dog. Mm -hmm. At one point, WGBH had a folk music show, and this, that tune became their theme song for for their announcements about you know listen to our folk music show I tell my ma when I go home the boys won't leave the girls alone they pull my hair stole my comb but that's all right till I get home she is sad so she is pretty she's the belle of Belfast city she is caught in one two three Well, I don't know, I guess I started off being interested in folk music around, you know, from the 60s, um, Dylan and stuff like that, and that, that got me deeper and deeper into folk music, and from from that acoustic music seed that was planted, I started to listen to bluegrass and old-timey music, and what got me into Irish music was, even though, you know, I come from an Irish background, we, we never had much true traditional Irish music in the family, it was more... Bing Crosby type Irish music that I was exposed to as, as a youth. I never really heard really good traditional Irish music until one day I happened into a bar in New York City in Manhattan called the Bells of Hell, which I believe was either run by or managed by or owned by Malachy McCourt. This is back now in the late 60s, early 70s. And I just happened in on an Irish session and I just couldn't believe it. It just like, I, I, at the time I was into old-timey American music, which is kind of, is, has its roots in the Irish traditional music and it just blew me away. I just never heard music like that before in my life. And, um, and that's what got me into traditional Irish music. <laughs> I heard uh, this folk rock group in the early 70s, late 60s, uh, Fairport Convention, and it used a fiddle, and it was just amazing to me. And uh, I got interested in that, and I, I had the desire to learn to play the fiddle at the time, although at the time I was playing in a rock band, just playing rhythm guitar and singing. This was when I was in high school. And uh, 
Years later, I remember the moment very well. I was driving out to a party somewhere and I had the local radio station, FM radio station on and the DJ decided to play something by the Chieftains. And I heard that stuff and thought that there was something there that I wasn't hearing in the music I was listening to or playing that I wanted. And uh, at that point I got real interested in learning to play. But it's been hit or miss all my life, you know, just trying to make it up and learn from recordings and stuff. And so not, not the old traditional way of learning from a master player. gave me a place to start uh, creating music, writing music, that uh, I could try out and people would like and, and perform. And I grew up playing, learning, learning to play the violin and playing in college orchestras and that kind of thing. And you sit there and you play some somebody else's piece and you stop and start when the conductor tells you to. And this was a chance to kind of jump in and make your own music fresh, right from the beginning. Write it, arrange it, perform it. And uh, so that was, that was very exciting to be able to do. How I first heard about the band, it was 1976, the year of the uh, bicentennial, and I was a junior at Newton North High School and had just written my uh, history paper on Songs of the American Revolution. And I was very excited to hear that there was going to be live um, colonial music right there in Newton at the Jackson Homestead. And so one afternoon after school, um, or maybe it was a Saturday morning, I was at school a lot on the weekends because I was in a lot of theater stuff. Um, I heard that there was going to be this live colonial music and I walked over to the Jackson Homestead and there was this band called, I didn't think I knew it at the time, the Gloucester Hornpipe and Clog Society. And I thought they were fabulous and in fact I bought their album and I still have an LP of the White Album and I own it, I found it in my basement. I actually came and heard the Gloucester Hornpipe and Clog Society in a um, in a concert at I think it was a coffee house in Watertown, um, or sometime or other as a young adult, I was really struck by their rendition of Katie Cruel, um, which I don't think I'd ever heard before, but I just liked the, I liked the song a lot, and that stuck in my head for a long time, and so it was kind of neat to find myself playing with the same band. Um, well, really, I wasn't interested in folk music until I joined the band. I had. I had played uh, accordion when I was a kid. I started at five, but I, I mean, I just I took lessons. I played pop music, and I had also taught myself how to play keyboards. And I wasn't playing folk music. I, I mean, I loved folk music. I loved you know Dylan and um, you know long, a lot of the '60s uh, singer songwriters and so forth. But I really wasn't playing that until I got involved in the band, and then I you know got totally immersed in the traditional Irish music and jig, jigs and international folk music, and eventually I got involved in Cajun music and playing uh, in Cajun bands like the Boogaloo Swamis and the Squeezebox Stompers. Mm. So uh, that was a turning point, really. Um, my brother John, uh, he was kind of into the early rock and roll, but my sisters, uh, Kathy and Mary in particular, were into folk music and learned to play the guitar and then the guitar was eventually passed down to me and I taught myself and Kingston Trio and Peter Paul and Mary but I wanted to keep going deeper and deeper I said well where did they get this stuff from? Oh Bill Monroe, okay, or blues, and I'll go all back to Muddy Waters, okay who did, who did he learn from? So a kind of a not a really scholarly approach but just I wanted to see where what the root of this stuff was, what was the most close to the ground maybe and I've always loved it, and I've always loved all different kinds of folk music, so it's, it's worked out nicely. I get to play a bunch of different instruments depending on what band I'm in, so it's great mandolin, fiddle, banjo, guitar. In the 70s I discovered Irish music, the Chieftains, the Boys of the Lock, and it was love at first listen. And in fact, I played with a band in the streets of Harvard Square in the mid-70s, and uh, we shared a stage with the then Gloucester Hornpipe and Clog Society in 1976, when the mayor's office had a big cultural program. We played in front of the New England Aquarium doing sea shanties, and the band that followed us was the Gloucester Hornpipe and Clog Society. So I met them then, and then joined them 12 years later. No, I always thought that everyone was very kind of 
democratic and not competitive and kind of yeah. easy about things. The, actually, so there wasn't true. much arguing. How do you want to do that? I think the, the whistle and the accordion. The whistle and the accordion. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Well, yeah. start. Yeah, whistle and the accordion. Do you want to? Or I can do it on flute. Well, maybe you should do it without the accordion, and I'll come in on the bees, and it'll be you and guitars. Okay, so we have an arrangement. I mean, I remember one example of this was you and John playing guitar, and John would have an opinion on a chord, and so you would change it to play the chord that he wanted, and he'd say, that's much better, and you'd say, but at the performance, you can't control me, <laughs> you know, you can't tell me what chord I'm going to play, and he would just laugh, but that was sort of a, a good-natured bantering that went on, and nobody really pressed their point. Because we have a thing worked out at the beginning. I don't come in right at the beginning. I come in after a certain thing. So I'll, I'll play the background to the first verse, and then I'll, you play the background for the second verse. So I'll play the background. Right. And of course, you come in on St. Andrew, both of us. Yeah, just yeah. A kind of nod or, or you know. I actually found a great what, Wiggle your great eyebrows or something, so I know when it's time for me to come well, in. Just, just, just come in on the second verse. Okay. Oh. Do the backup, the vocal, the, the vocal backup, I mean. I guess, I don't know. Second verse. He's going to do the first verse, and I'm going to do the second verse, and then he's going to come back and do the third verse. That's great. We used to end that by kind of getting softer, and then just cut the last one off, kind of just quickly. I think we sound better on the fiddle, though, than the mandolin. You think so? I think so, yeah. Can you do it on the fiddle? I could try it. Yeah. I'm a little rusty on the fiddle, but you think yeah. so too? No. Okay. Let's see. I'm at on the fiddle with this thing. It's nice to be down here. You should play it. Yeah. I here. can play it. Come in on the, on the second time through, because everybody kind of comes in then. All right. I can't do There's it. a couple of places where I go wrong that I'm just going to um, skip a couple of notes to be on the safe side. And Maybe I'll just play it right. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. Well, do what you do. Just come in on the when everyone comes in. That way you won't be out so much. That's what I like yeah. to do. Yeah. Just a second, okay. Just a second time through. Okay. Okay. tradition in music that's going on in Ireland and all over the world in the so-called Irish diaspora. And we're, I would say, sort of a cousin to that. We're doing 
were there's the revivalists versus the traditionalists in the folk world, those who learned the music at their mother's or father's knee, and those who fell in love with the music and, and learned it later, even though it may not be a tradition they grew up in. And we fit into the revivalist camp, and yet that itself is becoming a tradition too, I think. So we're, we're sort of Irish, but folk, and I think that's own vein, parallel and interacting with the more sort of heavily traditionalist Irish movement. And I think it's going strong. I think growing up, you know, with the folk boom, that that was a, a huge influence on a lot of people. And I think that's what started the boom in, you know, in Ireland and France, here. You know, I think a lot of countries have rediscovered their culture. Well, when I first uh, got involved, we played a lot of the traditional Irish jigs and reels, and then, but also uh, we played a lot of your originals, and then um, I think through your uh, your uh, cont contribution with some international folk music, we started playing, um, you know, songs in ninety time Israeli music, Macedonian music. Uh, we even did an Italian polka, and I started writing a few songs, so we did a few of mine. I did, uh, we did this song called Desert Wind, which sort of had a, a Middle Eastern sound to it. And we were playing a tune that we knew as a tune, not a song, called the Swallowtail Jig. <laughs> and suddenly this guy, who we really didn't know, and um, he very politely asked if um, we would mind if he sang the words to this tune. And come and man not iden, and will a nice or a, will a nice or iden, I for a, and I my rohodan, I my rohodan, I my rohodan. I sang out, and I began singing to it, and um, instead of going da di da di da, I made it Celtic sounding. And David turned to me and he said, So you know the words? <laughs> I said, I didn't know that tune had words. I didn't words. know tune had words, and the choice was, I just made this up, you know, just singing, or... Oh, if that works, Yeah. <laughs> and the... Yeah part meant that when they rehearsed next time, they asked me to come and sing that song, and then it got on the record, and then they found out the truth, and then... David wrote but the Pointe Boy note, which said it was perfectly legitimate sure. because it was really Pointe Boy. And you tell because you weren't there. It was when we were having a rehearsal one day. And Betsy said, I'd like us to do some Celtic singing. And I said, Great. Uh, you mean like what Jeremy does? And she said, No, the real thing, not that. <laughs> and I said, What? <laughs> events, actually two of the big events in our band history, were our trips to Ireland. So the first one, um, we were invited 
you know, to come as an international band. How are the Irish? Tell me, tell me about the Irish. The Irish people's reaction to your band. Um, it was, it was great. Um, the first of all, there, and I actually have a couple of photographs of this, of these absolutely wonderful, joyous children with their mouths open, staring at me and the pogo cello, and they followed us from venue to venue as we played, like, um, like the I was a pogo cello pied piper. <laughs> they, they were so absolutely fascinated by the instrument and um, and they were having so much fun with it what I can tell you from the very first time we heard our group from Boston Massachusetts we thought they were absolutely brilliant, and I think you all agree, don't you? I think, I think as well, they're really having a good time in Ladder County, and I think they'll come back. But I'd like you to reassure them and to show them just how much you appreciate the absolutely brilliant pieces of music you've been hearing over the past three nights. One final big round of applause for the Gloucester, Hornpipe and Cloud Society. Thank you all very much. We do indeed want to tell you that it's a great privilege and a great opportunity and a great joy for us to be here in Letterkenny. Thank you. So over the years there's been the vocalists versus the instrumentalists. And, um, I think things are, are fair, you know, the way we solve it is that we do a tune set and then we do a song. We do a tune set and we do a song. You know, I'm all about the vocals and yet I've learned a tremendous amount, you know, about Irish and other kinds of music. And I just... I have had a ball um, backing Diane on the, everything from The Lady in Black, which I adore. I had wanted to write that story for years, and you beat me to it and did a m much better job than I ever would have done. I love that, love, love, love that piece. So I find that I'm leading more, leaning more toward the traditional, but you've picked up a couple of my pieces and you know backed me on some of them, mm -hmm. and it's certainly been a delight to just trade off Oh, that I was what I would be, then should I be where I am not? Here am I, where I must be, where I would be, I cannot, oh, little lily day, oh, the little Leo day. I know who I love, and I know who loves me, I know where I'll go, and I know who'll go with me, oh, little lily day, oh, the little Leo day. And I've, I've often said, you know, music is my team sport, and I play on a bunch of teams. I play on, on the band team, I play, I sing Renaissance music with Fox Luchins, I sing in my church choir, I sing in a women's a cappella group, and these are all my teams. I live much of my life in the a cappella space. So I run shanties, I run pub sings, I'm in a music hall group, um, I sing close harmony duo, close harmony trio, but I was, I really thought of myself first and foremost as an a cappella vocalist. Heave away, haul away, heave away, haul away, try that. Heave away, haul away. And I sing another line that goes like this, and you sing, and we're bound away for Australia.
my bully bully boys. Heave away, haul away. Heave her up and up, she make a noise. Cause round, round away for Australia. And Cape Cod cats don't have no tails. Heave away, haul away. They love to maul in the northeast gales. And round away for Australia. But as singer-songwriters, we perform a lot in a, in a kind of very performance-oriented setting, and you're up there by yourself and people are just listening to you. This band doesn't feel like that. Even when you are performing your own pieces, there is such a sense of community at every single one of the gigs that we play, both on stage and in the audience, that it's a much more theater-in-the-round feeling than anything I have felt standing up on a coffeehouse stage. Found a way for Australia. Sounds fever up, my bully, bully boys. Fever away, all the way. Fever up, the not you make a noise. Found a way for Australia. Yeah. Yeah. So we're we're you you're you're pulling from people, different people's. Abilities and uh, and and strengths, and uh, so that it it's a varied kind of a it's a varied kind of a uh, an experience. Whereas, whereas you see most bands, there'll be certain roles: a lead singer and you know a keyboard player or whatever. It, but with these these bands, like 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 Gloucester Hornback and Claude, you have different roles at different times, and different people are being spotlighted. It's a review almost in the old sense of. Of like a, of the old vaudeville acts, it's where where there's a diff, the the spotlight goes to different people around, and it's it's not one thing. And it's sounds and textures, and that's all. That's all. You have a whole kaleidoscope of them, you know. So I, that's one of the that's one of the great things about it. it it's got its. Uh, it's not widely known. It's not uh, James Taylor, or somebody like that, a New Englander, but it's. Uh, it's got its following in in the areas where there's an interest in that kind of music, and I and I think that it's they're well known with their crowd, and so so uh, you know I, I think you've made a place in New England in that in that niche. <laughs> About the band is that it manages to retain its identity as people move in and out. Um, I came into the band at a time where it was at a very low ebb um, and I, I guess I would say that I brought a fair amount of energy to the band and I certainly had some very, in, very strong opinions about what kind of music we should do and what kind of material. What, I guess one of the things that I came to the table with 
was to really market us as three distinct niches and say, we should do an Irish set for people who want to hire Irish. We should do an 1812 set for people who want to book just that. We should do a full set on the Revolutionary War. We should do all maritime. And so kind of developing lines of business within the band. And early enough, people kept throwing in ragtime, waltzing with bears, and Johnny Be Good. And I'm like, what? Go, Johnny, go, go, go. Go, Johnny, go, go, go. Go, Johnny, go. What is this? So I struggled in the early years with kind of trying to focus us to be more marketable because coffee houses were not what they were 20 years ago. And I felt like we would get more gigs if we were going to these niche markets. And I think that I'm fortunate that I didn't succeed in stamping out what turns out to be this wonderful eclectic character of the band that I didn't really appreciate until way later in the game because it gives us this fabulous artistic freedom to whip out Johnny B. Good in the middle of an Irish set and that's very much who we are. <laughs> so that's, it's, there's something really unusual about this particular band because we, we blend stuff that comes out of nowhere. So it, re it really becomes an outlet <clears throat> for creativity and creative fulfillment. I think that, that is a very important part. And <clears throat> I don't think we set out to do that. I think it evolved. And, yeah. and there was a, an atmosphere that <clears throat> was encouraging. People, you know, were saying, yeah, you know, bring your stuff to the band. Yeah. Let's, let's hear it, you know? That's that's one of the things I think that the, the one of the strengths of the band and uh, and in in lots of different repertoires there's a colonial repertoire there's the tune playing repertoire and then you yourself Owen you compose a lot of things and you know we've well, over the years have played those things and so it 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 I think it rewards rewards individuals you can you can make a mark in it you can you know you can you use the band for for what you want to be able to do it because it's it's no no but there's no one there's no one big uh, there's no Svengali behind it you know it's again um what's it been what 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 is being in this band or starting this band meant to you um it's meant just a great deal to me um and it's filled with surprises the biggest of which is that when we started the band we had no idea how long this band uh, would exist and it's existed for 30 years at this point and uh, so every year uh, that it continues is, is a great delight and surprise. It's also been really wonderful because although there's certainly turnover in the band um, there is a lot of uh, stability so uh, people like John Berger for example have been in the band I don't even know 15 years 20 years at this point um, and most of the band members um, not only have been in the band, but uh, as this uh, reunion uh, concert weekend uh, proves, come back and uh, play with us, and uh, we renew our friendships and uh, our love of the music. So it's become a, a real, um, it's certainly become a part of my life that um, is tremendously important, and uh, as I've often said uh, in difficult times kept me sane. <laughs> a lot of the a lot of the years I've, that I was playing with the band I kind of didn't know where I was going with the rest of my life and I kind of I kind of still don't that's something that's sort of stayed with me and the band was something the band was something that you know kind of kept me active and centered in a musical way while other things were kind of while other things were kind of changing. Yes, I love playing with the band. I love the different interesting places that that I go with the music that we get to, that uh, worlds that we sort of explore that we wouldn't if we weren't playing this kind of music. We, we've gone and played in uh, historical mansions and museums for different uh, private parties. 
just sort of get a, a, a quirky view of uh, the Massachusetts universe. It's been fun. And the music itself, I just love interacting with all the other members of the band. And the different people I've played with over the years as the band mutates. Being in the band has shaped my whole life in, in profound ways. Um, the people in the band have become my lifelong friends. I married someone in the band. We have a child, which would never have happened had I not been in the band and met Owen. Um, so, so, so many major life experiences have happened because of my association with the band. It's, it's really pretty amazing. It's, it's shaped everything. Well, it meant, it's meant a lot. Um, so uh, I had no, I mean, I always played music, but I never actually thought of actually playing out publicly. And so that changed uh, my life quite a bit. And eventually now um, I'm a re retired uh, teacher, college professor, but my whole life right now is all about playing out, playing music and so forth. So um, it was the slippery slope. That, that really, in a lot of ways, changed my life. Well, I didn't realize how much it meant to me more until recently. It's, you know, this year, getting together, um, this is, I don't know how many years I've been coming out here. Since I moved to Colorado, like 13 years ago, I've been trying to make it out every year. A few years I've missed it. Um, and lately, it's gotten to be almost in part an exercise to get together and see who of us is left. But when that happens, you have that initial sense of loss that, you know, wow, you know, you hit a point in your life in middle age when you realize all the things that you've lost that have fallen away from you over the years. And you start taking stock. And I look around and I see all these friends, people that I have this musical relationship and this friendship with that has lasted all these years. And it's kind of a way for all of us, I think, to get together every year and take stock of each other and share things and talk to each other and so I guess. It's just been one of the most wonderful sort of uh, social groups. You know, at, at different periods in our life, uh, you make friends, you lose friends, you go to different uh, schools, but the people in this group have been a kind of central social center for for many of us for our lives because we we get together at least every year those of us who aren't in the band regularly to have this reunion concert and and uh, dinners and brunches and uh, everybody who's been in the group is a is kind of an old friend almost and we share our lives with each other and it's and you know that's been very important and and, and a great joy of uh, being in a group like this. And in fact, if you look at our webpage, one of the uh, most interesting parts of the webpage is the page of the X-Band members, uh, which is now much more numerous than the people that are actually in the band. But the X-Band members have gone on to play with other groups and make CDs and lead other lives, live in other parts of the world, other parts of the country. But we're all kind of in touch with each other as, we, as best we can be. And uh, feel like it's a kind of a family almost that we belong to with, with each other. Well, and it felt like it was, for me, being in Boston, and many of us didn't have family here. So it became kind of a family. And even a few years ago, Lynn said that, just a few years ago we were at the reunion next day brunch, and she said, it's really family, isn't it? It's just a different... Yeah, feeling. On uh, the uh, each of the CDs, especially the first one in 1978, there's a picture of the band. Take a look at that, and take a look at us now. <laughs> <laughs> and see if you can figure out who's who. <laughs> the, two of, the two people selling the CDs in the back of the orchestra are two of our children. And it's up to you to figure out who's, 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 who's they are. <laughs>
There. <clears throat> I'm interviewing you guys. What's it like being big bankers? Big bankers? Yeah. yeah. How did you enjoy the, this musical weekend? <laughs> Good. Okay. Excuse yeah. me, we're asking you for enthusiasm. Yeah, joy. Okay. okay. It was really gay! Yeah, that, that, yeah, that was gay. Wow, I can tell you enjoyed it. <laughs> what has being in the band meant to you? Oh, I don't know, having a good time, uh, getting to play on stage a lot. Um, certainly not the money, because um, I think we just got our taxes. I think I made like $1,300 last year playing the band, so uh, so it's certainly not that. Um, it's just a lot of fun, and it's a whole network of friends. When we say society, Gloucester Hornpipe and Cloud Society, it really is that. I think at first, when the name was first, um, was, was first thought up, uh, I don't know, I think they just thought it sounded good, but it, it, it ended up being a self-fulfilling prophecy because we are a society now. <laughs> Pretty much over 20 members, I'd say. <laughs> and that's, that's the function of a society. It wasn't a, it wasn't a band like, uh, you know, uh, that had a, a directive for a particular market. It, it, it was just a, a group of, of like-minded people who came together to create something. And, and, and I think that's the spirit of the band. That's why it's been democratic if that's the way you want to describe it but uh, open-minded it's a little bit like the mafia once you're in it's, it's hard to get out of it. <laughs> they keep pulling you back in but uh, but it's it's wonderful and you can you know reacquaint yourself with people and as soon as the music starts it's it's just flows like water so it's, it's great I think uh, and I hope that the band keeps keeps going and doing what it does uh, keeping the music alive I don't I have to say I don't know of any other band society like this that's been around, God, we don't even know if it's 40, it could be 50 years. And I mean, people have come and gone, but the, the feeling's always good. And to keep this kind of music tradition going is just amazing. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm so glad I, I was able to be a part of it. Now it's the society part that is really fascinating because it wasn't the Gloucester and Hornpipe um, band, it was the Gloucester and Hornpipe Society. And that idea of being a group of people in society with each other has led to the longevity of this band which is now approaching 30 years together. Because although I was only in, in, the, in the, from maybe 60, 74 to 79 and moved away and went to Long Island, I, I will always be a member of the Gloucester Hornpipe and Clogs Society, particularly when it comes to this reunion. And every band member who's ever been part of it has always remained a part of the Gloucester Hornpipe and Clogs Society. And I think it's that sense of, 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 of being a community, of sharing. For instance, even the money that was earned in the gigs was pooled so that people could use that money for experiences, like going to the Oil Island music festival, things like that. So the society has ended up affecting all of our lives. It's led to lifelong relationships. It's led to, I, I introduced Betsy Hartford to Owen. Um, I introduced a friend from England to Lynn Cadwallader, who ended up doing a transatlantic marriage. Um, so there have been all kinds of things that have happened in here in terms of people's lives. And it's uh, been, from a very small beginning, a richness beyond what we could ever have imagined in each of our lives. Well, I think David is the anchor. You know, we wouldn't have done this library tour without David being there to catch the offers. But, uh, and then the Pogacello. I mean, it's, it's part of the band, it's the show. You finish with, some, with him asking for an A. It's, just, it's perfect. So, <clears throat> this instrument, is not a traditional Irish instrument. Although we were very fortunate in uh, being able to play it in the International Folk Festival in Letterkenny, Donegal. This is a pogo cello. Pogo as in pogo stick because it bounces up and down. And uh, it has uh, this cookie tin, a Danish cookie tin. And boy, those cookies were good, I want you to know. <laughs> and uh, some braided bailing wire, and a coat hanger, and oh yes, cat food lids. <laughs> I know some of you are thinking, 
cat food? Well, why not tuna fish can lids? But you know, nothing quite has the timbre of cat food lids. And some jingle bells and a threaded wooden rod. And um, all of this was um, assembled by me, but uh, the true beauty of this, which I hope you'll have a chance to see after the concert, is the carving, which was done by my wife, Rita Dunapes, and uh, it has all of my totems. Cowbell. 